Before I introduce today's guest, I want to tell you about our sponsor, thegreatcoursesplus.com. The Great Courses is, of course, the teaching company's Great Courses, of which I've been a longtime fan and user. And now they have an app. You just put the download the free app on your phone. You tap on it, and you go to whatever uh, course you're interested in listening to. I just this is my latest one. I've been uh, going through Native Peoples of North America. This is lecture number 17 I'm up to now by Daniel Cobb, Ph.D. Uh, The beautiful thing about the Great Courses Plus app is that you can skip around with lectures. You don't have to just kind of grind through lecture after lecture for an entire course if you decide you don't want to listen to the whole thing. Um, This particular course is 24 lectures, and um, so like most courses, I probably won't listen to every single lecture. Uh, But this one I've been thinking about because of the whole conversation, national conversation on reparations. Uh, for African Americans, and if we go that route, then Native Americans certainly have a case to be made. And this history is really disturbing. It's difficult to listen to because it's reality of what happened um, here in North America. So um, I think it's the kind of thing where knowledge is good before we make political decisions. But anyway, that's not the point of this. I just uh, want to encourage you to uh, log on to thegreatcoursesplus.com slash salon, and then you get a free trial as a listener to my podcast, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash salon, and you get a free trial. It's great. So give it a shot. Give it a try. Uh, When you're driving, working out, doing chores, walking, hiking, whatever, it's a great way to consume content. All right. Thanks for listening. My guest today is Rebecca Wegg Sykes. Her new book is Kindred, Neanderthal, Life, Love, Death, and Art. Rebecca has been fascinated by the vanished world of the Pleistocene Ice Ages since childhood and followed this interest through a scientific career researching the most enigmatic characters of all the Neanderthals. Alongside her academic expertise, Rebecca has earned a reputation for exceptional public communication in print broadcast, and as a speaker. Her writing has featured in The Guardian, Aeon, and Scientific American, and she has appeared on History and Science programs for BBC Radio 4. She works as an archaeological and creative consultant and co-founded the influential Trowel Blazers Project, highlighting women in archaeology and the earth sciences. The book is really good. It's just beautifully written, um, and it's a summary, really, of everything we know till last week of the Neanderthals uh, integrating thousands of research papers and, and books about the Neanderthals. And so we, um, we cover all that along with, you know, who the Neanderthals were, what their bodies were like, what their minds were like, what they were thinking, how they survived, how we know all this stuff from archaeological finds. And, uh, and then we speculate about uh, what could uh, be discovered in the future about them, what we can and cannot know, the sociology of science, that is to say what to what extent we impose our own uh, ideas, values, theories of evolution onto the past, particularly with Neanderthals, uh, and then, of course, why they went extinct. I give you Rebecca Wag Sykes. So, uh, Rebecca, sure. thanks for coming on the show. The new book is Kindred, Neanderthal Life, Love, Death, and Art. Uh, I have to say, thank you so much. I, for I have having to say, me. this is a really beautifully produced book. Uh, as an author myself, I always appreciate it when uh, publishers put a lot of uh, effort and 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 money into a high quality uh, publication. The uh, the artwork is is really beautifully produced, and the paper is nice and thick. And uh, and also, I didn't see this. I just got the book yesterday because I read it uh, on audio, and then they sent me a PDF. But they have a nice insert of color plates, which is really nice as well. And I might add the, uh, the inside plates show all the, I guess the top hundred or 99 sites of where, uh, all these finds are made. <laughs> I am curious, you know, there's a huge clustering in, in Spain and France and, and so forth, Italy, and there's not next to nothing out here, but that's probably just an artifact of where people are searching. And there's more archeologists here than, than out here in the middle of nowhere. Oh, absolutely. It's it's partly to do with research history, for sure. Yeah, there's a genetics one on the back uh, end plate as well, because that's one of the things that people are really interested in. But it's it is pretty complicated <laughs> to explain. Yes. Well, I, I guess we could we could start there because um, 
you know, I've always been fascinated by um, the philosophy of science and biology of what's a species. And when I took uh, evolutionary biology in the 70s, I had uh, this terrific uh, evolutionary theorist, Bayard Brastrom. He was a herpetologist who studied um, sort of reproductive isolating mechanisms in lizards and how they had different bobbing behaviors that separated them or attracted them. And and this was one of many uh, reproductive isolating mechanisms. And he made us uh, memorize Ernst Mayer's definition of a species, which is a group of actually or potentially interbreeding natural populations reproductively isolated from other such populations. See, I still remember it. You could do a rap. <laughs> could do a rap with that. <laughs> uh, but the key to that, of course, was reproductive isolation, whether it's a mountain range that separates a population or a river or an ocean that comes in or behavioral differences or whatever. And then they, they become different enough that if, you know, the mountain range erodes away and the, and the populations overlap again, they can interbreed. Therefore, we have two separate species. And the ones that can interbreed, like, like lions and tigers, you get a liger, a tiglon, or whatever they're called, but they, don't, they can't produce viable offspring. They're, they're still a separate species. But what you've shown in, in, in the latest research is that most of us uh, have at least about 2% Neanderthal genes. I have that because I got my 23andMe test and it came back and I was like, yes, I have a little <laughs> bit of Neanderthal in me. I love that. <laughs> um, but then that th doesn't that challenge that that definition of a species? If they were interbreeding fairly regularly, then then maybe they're really us. Well, I think the definition, as we understand it, has to be sort of a bit more flexible to reality. And one of the the factors that's also important is um how recently two populations of organisms split off from each other you know how closely related they are anyway so um you know like dogs and cats they separated massively long ago millions and millions of years ago whereas homo sapiens so that's you and me um all the living people today um we come from a common ancestor with the neanderthals and we only separated jointly from that common ancestor somewhere around seven eight hundred thousand years ago which is actually very recent and in that sense it's a little bit more like um cows and yaks which are technically different species but they can interbreed and um sort of it's it's that sort of concept of of being separated but but not that long ago and they sort of um have a similar um sort of chronological separation and we see um something not too different going on with uh breeding for example between um uh, cave bears and polar bears and mm. things like this so it depends on sort of your own ancestry as it were and, and how closely you are related to that other group so for neanderthals um certainly what we can see genetically is that they definitely did separate um from the common ancestor with us and then it looks like they were largely not interbreeding um with the hominin that would lead to early homo sapiens um which early homo sapiens we believe emerge in terms of sort of their anatomy somewhere around 300,000 years ago roughly the same as neanderthals um but it doesn't look like there was, as far as we can see, interbreeding during this earlier mm. period. It's actually later that we start to see um, this genetic interaction. The earliest we think we can see it going on is before 200,000 years ago. But it's not frequent. It seems to be, um, it's not rare in terms of it seems to actually happen through time now and then. But it was never on a huge scale. So the morphological differences, you know, the fact that we do not look like Neanderthals, despite their having been interbreeding. And even all the way through their history, from 300,000 years right up till when they disappear in the fossil record about 40,000 years ago, they still look like Neanderthals, you know. So there had to have been quite significant separation of those populations, even with some interaction. Yeah. I remember back in the 90s, I had Vince Sarich speak for me at Caltech for a lecture series there. And um, this was before the genetic stuff. So he was talking about a fine where a, the foramen magnum, the hole through which the spinal cord goes into the brain, uh, was uh, there was some fine in which it wasn't quite 
circular like ours and it wasn't quite rectangular like Neanderthals. It was sort of in between. That was the best evidence for interbreeding. <laughs> so the genetics certainly changed everything. <laughs> yeah. I call this, by the way, I call this the Stephen Stills theory of interbreeding. You know, Stephen Stills, the rocker uh, who wrote that song, If You Can't Be With The One You Love, Love The One You're With. <laughs> so I imagine in a cold, dark cave, you know, some lonely uh, Homo sapiens uh, met up with a, a Neanderthal and, and and they had some fun. Uh, but yeah, as you or on the sunny steps of Siberia, <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah, the other um, uh, aspect of this that uh, one of my favorite quotes from Richard Dawkins, among his many, uh, and I can't remember exactly which examples it was, but I think it was no Homo erectus mother ever gave birth to a Neanderthal child or it could be a, a homo sapien child or whatever. In, in other words, species are essentially fixed when they're, you know, in their own generation. You know, they're not becoming something else. Like, okay, now I'm going to give birth to this next new species. It just doesn't work that way. So that also kind of no, disrupts no. this idea of a species like giving rise to a new species. How does that even happen? Because every species only gives birth to its own kind. Well, I mean, that's that's a much broader question about, you know, how evolutionary processes work. And then you're talking about different scales at which genetic mutations will accrue. Um, you know, some mutations will affect an organism very rapidly. They'll, they'll have a major effect on the body, from which point, if that's something that uh, is a positive effect, then it may be carried down the generation very fast. Other things, um, it's more to do with um, sort of smaller changes building up over time. And, and that's more to do with the isolation aspect. You know, if two groups are isolated, they'll sort of just drift off and become their own thing. Um, but with Neanderthals and modern humans, there we are still, at, you know, very early days with this. Um, you know, it, we're sort of saying, oh, interbreeding, blah, blah, blah. But actually, it's only a decade that we have known this. And Although, you know, I'm sure listeners will will have heard, you know, many, many news stories about, oh, new Deanderthal DNA and, and all of this. Um, we're still really, you know, just finding mm. our, our feet with the ancient DNA research. Um, we do not have many samples from Neanderthals. I mean, some there are tens of Neanderthals who have some genetic material, but there's only a handful for which we have high coverage nuclear genomes which really give us like a full picture on them um, and in terms of what was potentially useful that, that came to us from Neanderthals or in the other direction again that's like super early days we're still really trying to work out what came over to us did it did it hang around in us just you know because it was neutral and it didn't matter or were things that that we inherited you know that legacy that is in most living people um, did that benefit us? How did that benefit us? And we can pick things out, um, you know, to do with metabolism, um, skin, things like this. But it's not always entirely clear why that might have stuck around. And in evolutionary science as a whole, there there is a real tendency because we're coming at it from, you know, with hindsight to, mm -hmm. to try and always find an explanation that, that makes super good sense. Um, but things are often a lot more complex than that. Um, so I think with with Neanderthals, um, the other interesting thing you can talk about as well is um, is hybrid children mm. because they certainly existed. Um, that's why we have that legacy in us, um, because in that sense of you know one species becoming something else, that point where you have hybrids, that is the point at which things are, are different. And I think for me, I find all of the genetics. You know, I'm not. A geneticist. I'm an archaeologist. I'm trained in in artifacts, in material culture, and, and thinking about how people lived. And so, for me, the genetics I find it fascinating because I want to know what is the social context for these interactions, for people having sex and babies, basically. What's led up to that, um, and what does it mean that you have hybrid babies? Apparently, with uh, staying with both the early Homo sapiens groups, and we now uh, understand also with Neanderthal groups, because there's new research showing that Neanderthals probably got the whole Y chromosome, the male uh, chromosome, from early Homo sapiens. So those babies had to have stayed with the Neanderthals. So what does that mean about how those hybrids were able to grow up in those two different cultures and social settings? There must have been a very 
fundamental compatibility there. And presumably um, they... Which I think is quite interesting. And presumably they could interbreed, those hybrid children could interbreed with either Homo sapiens oh, yeah, they or Neanderthals. And, yeah. They had, exactly. They had to have their own children and their children in order for that to be visible in us today. Yeah. So again, that seems like we're the same species by that definition. Unless you want to pull back and do something different, like a fuzzy set of characteristics and other criteria, like how long we've been separated from our common ancestors, something like that. Um, at, at, yeah, I would say we're, we're very closely related populations of, of hominins, you know, in, in that sense, definitely. Yeah, people get very confused about the word race. Our latest issue, I think I have it up there, of skeptic is on race. You know, and, and it, because of the controversy now, that's all anyone talks about in America is race. And, and it, But it's really populations is a better term. Technically, right? the word race is so loaded politically and historically, it has a lot of baggage. Population is much more accurate uh, way to think about it scientifically. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a completely different yeah, question yeah. of of what we mean about about race in terms of living people. But we can't we can't really discuss that when we're talking about populations ten thousand, right. twenty thousand, hundred thousand right. years ago. It's it's impossible to really do that. So yeah, that's why I I use the word populations. But um, it's a different uh, sort of question, I think, different scale. But just on the big picture again, so the last common ancestor of Neanderthals and and us or whatever we are, Homo sapiens, was. What, like five six hundred thousand years ago or something like that so uh... yeah so um we we understand it from the genetics and also from from the fossils although they are they're sort of relatively sparse around that point um it appears that uh we shared a common ancestor with neanderthals somewhere between eight to six hundred thousand years ago um presumably that was in africa this source population um what we do believe, though, is that it was not like a single population in Africa in one area. Um, there's there's strong hints that there was structure to this population, which basically means there were different subpopulations in different regions of Africa, which were interacting in some ways genetically and sort of a mosaic of different anatomies were emerging. Um, they coalesced in one lineage coming out of this large meta population and became eventually by about 300,000 years that um, sort of really beginning to to look in some areas like um, early Homo sapiens, like some had very flat faces from Morocco, for example, there's a find um, with a very flat face, but the rear of the head still looks quite sort of um, archaic. Um, and by 150,000 years ago, you have fossils from uh, Africa, which basically look very much like living people they're not very different at all um whereas the neanderthals something similar is going on um their their lineage also separates off from this uh, meta population presumably then disperses away from africa or potentially this happened in the near east which in environmental terms was actually pretty similar um and then become sort of endemic as it were in western Eurasia. Um, and from around um, 350, 400,000 years ago, we start to see the physical features again emerging in um, different parts of Europe, but, but really that they, they are sort of early Neanderthals by that point. So in terms of chronology, we, there's almost a contemporary development between Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens, but in different regions. Um, but but it is important to to understand that although traditionally and sort of historically with with research um, sort of focuses, people have always said, "Oh, Neanderthals are Europeans." Mm. They're not. If you look at the geographic area that we now know their range covered, they are more Asian mm. than European, based purely on you know square miles. Um, we don't have as many sites, as you said, looking at the map from that area, but that's probably to do with research history, different kinds of preservation, things like this. Um, certainly, we we do not know the eastern extent of where they got to. They could have been off in China. We don't know that. Um, so that's fascinating, you know, exactly that the, the realm of the Neanderthals has really sort of expanded um, massively now. What's the furthest east? Uh, that we have evidence for? 
Um, it's a Siberian site, um, Denisova Cave, right. which people probably have heard of because there's another hominin from there, the Denisovans, um, which is our close relations of Neanderthals, as we understand. So the, the Neanderthal lineage that separated from our common ancestor then split again somewhere around sort of 500, 400,000 years. Um, and then the Denisovans came out of that uh, sort of splitting. Um, but again, we, oh, yeah. we say the Denisovans. Yeah, that's way, um, way out here. It's, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very far, very far east. Um, we know that the Denisovans were probably also a complicated uh, population that appear to be much more Asian based, although we have so few sites at the moment because we only just really found out about them and they've been largely identified in genetic terms. The largest fossil we have is is like a jaw from uh, Tibet, but that seems to be sort of quite different than the site in Siberia mm. in genetic terms. It's still it's still closely related, but it's not identical. So there is a, a vast sort of richness of other hominin things going on in, in Eastern Asia. Um, and we don't know where Neanderthals fit into that. You know, was Denisova Cave like their wild east? You know, that was that their frontier or did they get further than that? Um, we don't really know, but it's it's really fascinating. Yeah, the, the populating of, of the Americas, uh, that story gets more and more complicated uh, as the decades go on. It looks more and more like there were multiple migrations into the Americas, maybe from both directions. But certainly, you know, here we're talking about Neanderthals pushing further and further east. I wonder if any of them ever made it over the land bridge and into the North Americans. I mean, there's no evidence for that, I guess. But well, I mean, possible. yeah, the 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 the, oc the early occupation of of um, America, you know, that's it's a tricky subject in terms of the archaeology, in terms of indigenous communities having, you know, extremely long histories of of their own occupation and understanding of where they came from um and certainly there's a sort of a parallel there with disbelief of the aboriginal people in australia having you know said we have been here forever and you know first it went to 20,000 then 40,000 now people were in australia pre 65 it looks like 65,000 years ago so there is in my head, there's no reason why there could not have been a much earlier occupation in um, in North America. Whether other hominid species got there or not, you know, that's that's going to have to um, wait for further studies. But but it is it is certainly a an area that is contentious not only from the science but for those communities because it's you know it's massively meaningful to them um, and a lot of what they've said previously has been ignored yeah there was that kennewick man that was found in Wa state of washington who who had very different characteristics mm. than native american populations of of the uh, what were thought to be the earliest migrations in fact i think he looked kind of japanese or asian or something like that in terms of his features and that, that led to this idea that, well, there must have been multiple migrations coming over. But that's kind of beside the point for Neanderthals, because we don't have evidence of that yet. Although, you never know. I mean, so much of this depends on how many of you are out there digging, and then also reading your book, how much of it is just luck, you know, where there's a, a you know, a, a road construction project. And, you know, boom, there's a there's a find, and everybody has to stop and bring in you guys <laughs> to get, to get the collect collect the fossils and so on before you continue. And maybe there's just more of that in Europe than there is in Siberia, you know, where there's just not many road construction projects or mines. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the the industrial revolution, you know, and sort of geopolitical military expansion and stuff. A lot of the very early nineteenth century finds are tied up in that, you know, the railroads being built or quarrying for increased demand for limestone and marble. And then in Gibraltar, um, you know, one of the earliest Neanderthal finds, it was the military officers that were there that set up their scientific society where this this skull was was brought and, and then curated and only recognised somewhat later. So it is really interesting that there are so many of those connections. And yeah, the, the situation in terms of history and politics is is rather different in other regions um but yeah i mean you know like i was giving a seminar to um to really great heritage uh, series actually called um down ancient um ancient pathways with the sharma heritage center in india um they have a really great series online from lots of archaeologists and you know i was discussing with the indian colleagues and there's nothing leander from 
from the Indian subcontinent, mm. but never say never, you know. Um, we, we, as far as we can see, Neanderthals lived in every sort of environment except truly harsh periglacial, like Arctic mm. conditions. Um, we don't know of any sites where they were in like full on deserts or in like really, you know, tropically type jungle. So we, we don't see them there. But Again, you 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 might you may not sort of see that because of preservation issues and things. And certainly, they are in Central Asia. You know, Uzbekistan around that area. It's extremely arid, completely different environment to Wales or, or France. You know, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> um, so I think their their sort of potential range um, we sh- we should expect to be surprised. I think by the Neanderthals. I think that's what they've shown us for a long time. Yeah. The other thing I was thinking about reading your book was the Copernican principle. That is, we're not special, and if there's so much like us, and we're able to do X, Y, and Z, live in these different environments, and so on, very probably they could have too, both physically and cognitively. Well, I mean, that, that's the question. That's you know, I mean. Neanderthals in the environments that they lived in, in in the world that they lived in, which was a hunting and gathering world, um, they appear to have been very successful at that. Um, and you know, it's it's like the the accusing current hunter gatherer peoples of of not being, you know, clever or advanced because they don't have a combine harvester, they don't need yeah, one, yeah. you know. And I think that's the question. You know, people say, what would you know, would Neanderthals have ever developed into what into a, a global hyper urban connected thing that we exist in right now? And I have no idea. Um, certainly, there are technological differences between them, and and there are things that it seems early Homo sapiens um, groups who were contemporary with them, you know, from eighty thousand years and later, were doing slightly different things, but the difference is not enormous um so yeah i don't know it's it's an interesting question as to whether that's to do with capacity or sort of opportunity or just not needing to to do those things you know um i yeah. I'd, I'd sort of wouldn't be entirely surprised if we found sort of a bit of baked clay on any editor site one day, for example. <laughs> yeah, Steve Gould used to make the point that, you know, we have to get away from this kind of ladder of progress, this linear uh, chain of being that, you know, has been with uh, Western intellectual life for so long and that it's a richly branching bush and that species aren't becoming anything. They're doing just what they're doing. And if they're successful, then they're doing just fine. They don't need to become anything else. And you know, you, you see that in a lot of the language, particularly in documentaries, you know, we, we found this tooth and it's it's almost a modern tooth. It's like it's trying to become a fully modern skull or tooth or something like that. It's like, no, it's it's doing exactly what it's doing just fine. And, uh, you know, we think of our species as so successful, you know, but what we're maybe 120,000 years old. And so, you know, we're about a quarter of the way for how, how long Neanderthals lasted. So let's not, uh, you know, congratulate ourselves too early. And uh, in your chapter on the extinction of the Neanderthals, I was thinking, you know, maybe the question is not why did they go extinct, but how, why did we survive? Because extinction is the rule in biology. Yeah. And if you look um, in genetic terms at some of the very early dispersals that we can see, um, uh, certainly in, in some fossils, you know, going from Africa out into Asia um and and in the genetic evidence that we can see multiple phases of of interbreeding from about 100,000 years onwards um those very early groups are barely existent in genetic terms to date they're almost extinct um you know whereas the neanderthals are actually less extinct than some of those super mm. early homo sapiens groups so mm-hmm. You know, okay, they're not walking around, but they are in genetic terms. They are still here. They're successful. They still exist. Um, so, you know, what we what we define as success and what we're willing to to look for, and and sort of the the bars that we set for different species is also an interesting question. You know, what we're willing to to see is uh, is there, and and in te- you know, in technological terms and things, as I said, there's Neanderthals for a very long time. Um, there was a general sort of perception or claims that their their culture and their technology was 
pretty boring. Um, you know, it, it was a bit better than super early hominins, but they invented what we call prepared core technology, where you, you shape the core in a certain way, which allows you to get flakes off a bit more predictably. And and after that, they did nothing. Um, and that is not at all what, you know, modern archaeology shows us that they were capable of. Um, they were really diverse in the ways that they that that they worked different kinds of stone and um, they were completely aware of what they were doing at any time they were working a particular core they could switch techniques flip stuff around they were very adaptable at a micro scale where you know just one thing that you're trying to make they can they can be adaptable but also in terms of the the different contexts in which they live the different environments because not only did they live across this huge geographic range, which has its own variability there from the beginning, you've got coasts, mountains, plains, forests. Through time, you have multiple phases of climate change that they survived and adapted to, including um, a world around 120,000 years ago that was warmer than today. And is actually equivalent to to what we are facing, two to four degrees of warming. The Neanderthals lived in that world, um, in in d- massive deciduous forests in Europe. Um, that you know, we we're facing something mm-hmm. that they managed, but they were hunter gatherers. You know, they could they could spread out and adapt. That's very different to to the sort of situation that we're and, in. And three ice ages, as well. Or more? Uh, much, well, yeah, I mean, the 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 last ice age finished around sort of eleven thousand years ago, um, and we have a we have a sort of a staging uh, naming system that we use. So that's stage one. So we're in stage one right now, a warm period, an interglacial. Um, stage two is the last ice age, and that only began around um, sort of twenty four thousand years ago, something like that. Um, then you have stage three, which is sort of not really an interglacial um it's it's slightly warmer um but it's not a proper warm stage and that's the the period during which the neanderthals disappeared mm. around 40,000 years ago and then before that you have stage 4 a cold stage then stage 5 which was the super warm one we call that the eemian in europe then you have stage 6 very cold you know and it goes back um to around stage 9 is when they first emerged which was um a warm period again yeah so yeah they what we do see is that they did not really like extreme cold you know they they have they've had such a, a connection for so long with with you know ice age conditions and mammoth and woolly rhinos and and all of this and yeah that was part of of their world and the environments that they knew but when you see truly cold conditions coming in um and you know species like arctic fox or musk oxen um at that point the neanderthals you know they start to disappear mm. because they don't like it when it's super super cold um, and possibly they go extinct in some regions of northern europe during those periods or they may move um we're not quite sure which but what we can see is that when conditions warm up again after a, a deep glacial period and one of these points was around 60,000 years ago they come back pretty fast and we can certainly see that happening um, where there is a recolonization of Britain around 60,000 years ago. And there had been no Neanderthals there for a very long time before that, even during this preceding super warm phase, probably because the sea levels had risen so fast that no Neanderthals had got in. And horses are also absent, which is interesting mm. as well. Um so the sort of the the history of, of Neanderthals is certainly one of um of sort of flux and and things changing and when we look at the genetics within their own population their own history it definitely looks as if there were some really large scale um movements of populations across europe and and going perhaps into asia or in the other direction it seems that there's some some really significant upheavals happened um somewhere around probably around 100,000 until about 70,000 during the end of this warm period. And then it got super cold. Um, and so they they have their own internal history. Yeah. yeah. Years ago, I had a debate with uh, Robert Wright, Bob Wright, uh, the author of the book Non-Zero. 
So uh, Bob's thesis is that there, you know, in the history of life, there's been a slight advantage of cooperative non-zero game playing versus zero sum, and that we're we're the winners essentially because we're so cooperative and social. We have this, you know, incredibly sophisticated uh, uh, civilization all the way up to the internet and so forth. But but then he he says uh, he he's, he was kind of uh, attracted to Pierre uh, Pierre de, de, uh, Pierre de Chardin. The, uh, I'm saying his name incorrectly, the, the paleontologist. Yes, Teilhard, yeah. Teilhard, Teilhard, <laughs> yes. Uh, who had this kind of idea that there's almost a teleological pull in the history of, of humanity mm-hmm. towards something, which he called the new sphere, that it, which, which Bob says, is, well, that's the internet, you know, or this global mind kind of thing. Uh, but for that, he had to then do a counterfactual thought experiment. If we went extinct and Neanderthals survived, they would have the internet and jets and, you know, modern technology to which I said, I'm not so sure where, you know, is, is there evidence in the fossil record of tools advancing or art or, you know, cognitive capacity getting into that kind of stepwise where you eventually get to something like what we're able to do? I'm not so sure. I don't, I don't think that that's there. Well, I mean, it, I think it depends on what you define things as. Um yeah, there's, you know, there's no internet at all 50,000 years ago, clearly. Um, but in terms of sort of what we would say is is something that's cognitively complex, I think the, the understanding of what that means has shifted mm. a lot in yeah. recent decades. And also the, the archaeology has changed. You know, a lot of the, um, you know, like a, a, a tick list for supposedly modern behaviour has existed for a few decades and the Neanderthals have been ticking them (laughs) off and, Mm. you know, like, oh, they didn't do bone technology. Well, they didn't do it as much, but they could nap bone. They could work it. They could shape it. um, And we can, you know, there's a really nice class of tools that have only recently been recognized um, called uh, Lissoir, which are almost exactly like tools still used today for leatherworking. Um, they're rib bones, basically, um, and you use it to soften and to burnish the leather. And Neanderthals were doing that. We haven't found hardly any of them. But in sort of terms of, of the numbers of, of uh, objects from very early Homo sapiens sites, um, there's not that much of that stuff either. It is all quite rare. Um but also other things that have changed, you know, the evidence for Neanderthal interest in aesthetics has really begun to shift. Um, pigments, you know, there's a lot more evidence for them at least using um, pigments for something. Um, whether you're talking about African early Homo sapiens sites or Neanderthals, you have to always rule out sort of functional uses of pigment because there are a lot um, it can be used for working hides or you know sunscreen things like this um but in situations where that doesn't really seem applicable um there are cases now where we can see this for neanderthals and even more so particular sites where we can see pigments associated with other objects that do not seem to have a clear functional use so there is um uh, at an Italian site about 55,000 years ago, they're um, called Grotta Fumane. Um, there is a fossil shell, very small little fossil shell, um, that a Neanderthal had collected from probably up to 100 kilometres away. It was not local. It's nothing to do with food. You know, it's not a, a shell from foraging for seafood. Um, and that's interesting in itself that it's been carried. But on the outside of that shell, there is red pigment mm. as well. Now, if you found that in an early Homo sapiens site, it would be accepted as something with some kind of social symbolic interest or meaning or something aesthetic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's that. But then you have sort of that's like a little window and it makes you reassess other sites where you have shells with pigment, too. So there's a there are other sites where we have, um, you know, Neanderthals actually were quite capable coastal foragers and they were well aware of that as a resource. Um, and there is a Spanish site where we have shells which probably were collected for food, um, but they have pigment on them as well. And it's a mix mm. of different pigments with um, charcoal and, and iron pyrite. So instantly that seems to have an aesthetic mm-hmm sort of thing going on there that's going to be glittery and and you know if we didn't have the fossil shell site then 
that might not seem quite so solid. But then completely different in Croatia, around 130,000 years ago, um, we have something else going on where there are uh, eagle talons. Mm. Um, people may have seen you this, have actually. That, right? It was published as a, as a necklace. Yes. Um, yeah, that's a different site, but they look like that. Um, and that was sort of... Uh, that site was actually excavated in the 1890s, um, mm. and it's really interesting because it has a load of um, butchered, tons of Neanderthal butchered fossils and stuff. Um, but from a different layer, um, there are eagle talons, and that has been suggested to be pieces of a necklace. I'm not sure about that because to claim that things were actually strung together, you need quite strong evidence for little facets of polish and things, and that's not clear. But what was very recently published is that one of those claws has a mix of pigments mm. on it. Um, so it's a, I think it's red and, and yellow pigment with some charcoal and some clay. So, again, that's two different things that are unusual in themselves coming together. Um, so I think, you know, I could talk about tons of other examples and there's loads in the book. Um but when you look at the whole corpus of evidence, it starts to, to be quite difficult to to argue that Neanderthals did not have some sort of aesthetic interest, whether it's in colours or interesting objects or marking things as well, um, you know, whether incising or engraving. Um, so all of those things together, the evidence for what they were interested in aesthetically is really not that different mm -hmm. to early Homo sapiens in African contexts. The, the difference seems to be um, in Southern African sites where we have the most spectacular evidence um, of pigment use again, red pigments, they they seem to be combining um, pigment and marking um, where the the markings are quite formalized in a graphic sense. You know, they will, there's like lines around and then there's like hash marks that go over and things like this. You see that on pieces of ochre, but also fascinatingly at a, at a particular site called uh, Dieppkluf. Um, there's a whole tradition of incising these these sort of graphical patterns on ostrich eggshell, mm. and that goes through time at that site. So we do not see something like that yet for Neanderthals, mm. but all those elements are, there. are yeah. there in different material forms in different places. So, yeah, it's, there is something going on there for sure. Hard to know what to think when you see something like that, you know, because with the curse of knowledge, we we have what in mind what we would why we would do something like that. But to go back even just to an early Homo sapiens or Neanderthal find and think what were they thinking? Like the you know the handprint on the cave with the the blown paint around it, so it's kind of a negative. Uh, why would you do that? And you know, it's hard to know why. Yeah, I mean, I think it's also that. The archaeologists that you know come from Western countries, from from our classical understanding of art, you know, we have art as a very visual medium. It's a finished medium that you look at and you observe. It's like a gallery, whereas that is not how all of humanity understands aesthetics and art. You know, it can be much more an experience that is important during the creation, but not so much after. It's a bit like listening mm. to music. You know, that is the experience. Um, but you can have that with the material creation of something. Um, so there's no reason why um, some of the things we see, for example, like um, I was saying about marking surfaces. Um, there are a few cases now of pieces of bone where we can see really quite sequential looking incised sort of lines that are nothing to do with butchery. Um and, you know, you're tempted to kind of look at that and go, oh, is this is this some kind of information system? Is it notation? What does it mean? Um, but that's us looking at it. Perhaps it was it was meant to be held in the hand and felt or some some other sort of experience to do with um, senses that we're not appreciating because we're coming, as I say, for, from the culture that we are within and from our own intellectual background. We won't see that. And. I think it's it's akin really to really fascinating work that's been done um, in Germany looking at traces of activity in caves. So this is for um, Upper Paleolithic uh, cave art type caves, you know, later than the Neanderthals. But what was really interesting was that researchers invited um, Southern African 
uh, indigenous people who were some of the, the the last remaining exceptional trackers to come and look at these caves where we knew that there were footprints of people mm. and to look at them and try and see what was going on. And because they have a completely different cultural reference and a massive experience of understanding tracks, they could see totally different things in that cave than European researchers have been able to make mm. out. And I think the same thing is there with art. Um, you know, we we should we should be looking outside the things that we think are meaningful. Um, and you can see the same thing in the whole question about, um, you know, the treatment of the dead, mm. which is a, you know, another entire topic with Neanderthals. And that's a really similar um, context where we should question our assumptions. And yeah. um, we've sort of claimed for a long time that Neanderthals, you know, didn't really bury their dead or there's been debates over, oh, was it in a nicely cut grave right. or yeah, all yeah. of this? But that's that's not how everyone today deals with the right. dead. So why should they have done right. it that way? Yeah, yeah. I have this picture of the uh, Neanderthal burial at uh, uh, La Chapelle um, in France. Uh, in my book, um, Heavens on Earth, about the idea of the afterlife, you know, and trying to figure out in this chapter, who's the first person to think that this dead person may be gone, have gone somewhere else? You know, of course, that's impossible to know. Uh, but anyway, so I write about this. Uh, I hope I got this right here, that the uh, the bones were buried in a depression in the ground that archaeologists conclude could only have been intentionally dug. And uh, tephanomic analysis of the fossils indicate that they did not show cracks and weathering, as was found in nearby bison and reindeer bones. And then I'm quoting the authors, these multiple lines of evidence support the hypothesis of intentional burial. Evidence from other Neanderthal sites indicate that individuals decorated themselves with pigments, wore jewelry constructed of colored shells and feathers, and like the Shanidar finds, show signs. Some showed signs of having been cared for by others after injury and old age. Yeah, you discussed that about the guy that uh, clearly cannot have survived this massive injury uh, on his own. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, and I think with with the burial yeah. um, stuff, that's that's really nice because that's researchers today going back to really old collections. You know, the La Chapelle au Son burial or burial the skeleton was found in 1908 um there's been debate about that for so long and it's only just recently that people went back re-excavated that site found the depression and have, have done their best to actually work out what was going on there it is still debated um but now we have like absolutely fascinating new stuff coming from uh, shanidar in iraq there is a new newly found uh, remains of an adult there this is the first like intact skeleton that's articulated you know, all the bones are in the right place it's clearly not been disturbed of a neanderthal that's been found for decades and the research team there will throw everything that they have at that you know they'll be looking at not only the bones but you know taking tiny slices through the sediments to try and assess is this depression natural or was it scooped out you can you can really you know make a, a quite good assessment about that kind of thing um and but beyond sort of the, the burial thing, one thing that is really changing is is our understanding of just Neanderthals being interested in the dead in, in bodies. You know, there is increasing evidence that they were taking bodies apart, butchering, um, eating probably in some circumstances. And again, this is similar to the aesthetics, you know, that we for a long time that's been known that Neanderthals sometimes did that, and it's always been presented as aggressive or about starvation or anything but it does not need to be that way and we only need to look at how our closest relatives uh, bonobos and chimpanzees how they deal with 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 death which is a massive trauma in their groups because they're so closely knit um and they are so interested in the bodies you know they can't leave them alone for hours they want to touch them do stuff with them so for me i find that more of a of a plausible reason for for a bodies to be taken apart than than always to do with starvation yeah. and things like that. Yeah, and also, but you can't just leave a dead body lying there for days and weeks and months because of the. <laughs> well, yeah, there's that. <laughs> so as well. they, it, so an intentional burial could be something symbolic to have to do with the afterlife or whatever, but it could be just we got to get this thing in the ground because it stinks. Yeah, I mean, I think we shouldn't. I don't ever want to talk about like religion right. or afterlives or that because i think that we we can't know that and we won't know that but i think certainly we can 
we can discuss, you know, what the the impact of death would have meant, um, especially with newborn babies, you know, because that is the point at which we see, um, you know, cases in 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 chimpanzees where where babies that have died very young they held on to for days, weeks yeah. sometimes, and what we see in Neanderthal sites, yes, there are sites where there's bits and and of bodies and and they don't seem to have had any placement, although they could have been disturbed. But we do have um, a number of sites where you have entire bodies of newborn babies, absolutely fragile. And they're they're laid on their side, you know, and that's that's not a posture that a newborn can necessarily get in by itself if it's just dumped. They don't really sort of, right. you know, right. necessarily do that. Um, and so I think if you add all these different aspects of of evidence to do with an interest in mortality and and evidence for some kind of placement or covering of bodies, um, there's a definite trend. Um, a trend there that, that sort of goes beyond just accidental preservation yeah. of bodies. Otherwise, we would see so many more whole animal bodies and we don't. Yeah. And again, their brains were not just the size of ours, but larger than ours. And I guess we don't know from the finds that yeah, how convoluted <laughs> the brains were, or, you know, how many different areas they had. Um, or do we? No, no, we can because you can you can do like a well you you can just do a cast from the inside of the skull, but now we can do like three D coolness and you know like project it and do all this stuff. Um, so the brains were definitely a different shape, um, but the the size actually looks like it might be an artifact of um, sort of the biases in preservation that we seem to have fewer female mm. Neanderthal whole skeletons things. So what may have been going on is that when you just compare male Neanderthals with with male Homo sapiens, the difference is much smaller. So it might be something to do with that. Um, But certainly they were as large as us, if not larger. Um, But the the question is the different sizes of the different regions of the brain are not equal. Um, the, The front of their skulls was more sloping and, you know, the what we call the frontal region here, which is highly involved with sort of um complex thinking and things like this that's not as large at the rear it looks like the area which has the visual processing system was a bit larger their eyes are larger um so does that mean that well presumably they had more processing power but does that mean that that was at the expense of other higher cognitive function well that's really hard to say because we know from many kinds of brain studies today that brains are quite plastic mm. Um, you know, so what we don't have is a Neanderthal to put in an MRI scanner, basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, uh, but, uh, yeah. Another question I had in reading your book was, you know, when you, fi- you make a find of a particular body and let's say uh, it, you extrapolate from that, their arms were this big or the skull was that big or whatever. Is that representative of Neanderthals as a species or is that Og the... Uh, the the guy that worked on the skins the most, so his arms were bigger because he was the guy that was doing all these repetitive motions. In other words, how do you know it's 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 evolutionary versus that particular culture because that's how they worked? Well, we do actually have quite a large number of uh, Neanderthal fossils. You know, we've got thousands mm. of individual pieces of bones. You know, thousands, thousands, um, and overall, we have remains from probably over 200 individual Neanderthals um, f- all the way through mm. the, the age range. So I think our understanding overall of the variability in their bodies is pretty good. Um, what we do see is some differences at, at a regional scale. Um, Neanderthals from the Near East appear to be slightly more lightly built, um, not quite as, as heavy and robust. That might be to do with climate or something else i'm not quite sure but there are some differences um and some of that's going to be to do with small populations being cut off like we were talking about earlier how sort of just variation happens um but overall i think we do understand um their bodies and i mean as as you know i was just saying we don't have any Neanderthal to put in an mri scanner to understand their brains but we have the archaeology we have what they did yeah. you know and i think that is such a huge area that our understanding has has massively changed and that that's what people probably don't get in all the big headline discoveries it's about genetics or oh a new a new site or something but 
the shift in in our understanding of how sophisticated they were, their technology, the aesthetics, but also how they used space, the planning that we can see um, in in sort of at a landscape scale. You know that they they select. Uh, particular species they select the best animals from that species they hunt them then they butcher them with extreme skill they take the best parts from that body they take it to another site to process a bit more then they take it on further and you know there is just these cycles and webs of of complex true hunter-gatherer lifestyles um and that's it's completely clear that that is how they were living and and it's only with you know the, the last i'd say 30 years of, of meticulous advances in how we do archaeology and how we think about how sites form and how we can prove that, that layers have not been disturbed and things like this. It makes such a difference um, in, in our understanding of, of their capacity, I yeah. think. I started listening to your book uh, on a hike with my dog up here in the mountains above Santa Barbara, and, and, and we got off the trail and we were like bushwhacking. And I'm listening to your your story about how these these people lived out in environments like this, and I thought these people were badasses. I mean, I would be dead. I would be dead in a matter of hours out <laughs> I bet here. I'll give you that. <laughs> you yeah. know, Jared Diamond makes this point yeah, actually so. in, in he... his book Guns, Germs, and Steel, where he's talking about uh, intelligent differences. Because that was a, a big topic in the '90s, especially. But that you know, he when he's out with his. Uh, Papua New Guinean friends, and he realizes, you know, if I was alone out here, I'd be dead in days. And and yet they know how to use the environment and survive yeah. and so on. And <laughs> I saw you you um, you yeah. cited uh, Louis um, Liebenberg in your in your book. I I uh, I know I know him yeah. pretty well, and and I, he's done a few pieces for me and, oh. and skeptic on well because he's interested in the history of science, which is my area, but also kind of the cognitive capacity of what it takes to be a tracker. And that this would be an early form of kind of scientific reasoning, hypothesis testing. So here, here's, and I used his work yeah. in the opening chapter of uh, the moral arc in terms of like how to reason morally from uh, and scientifically as a tracker. So here's what I wrote. Drawing inferences about the movements of animals from their tracks, as hunter-gatherer trackers do, has obvious survival advantages. And we've been able to apply those inferential skills in everything from driving to the store to flying rockets to the moon. Historian of science and professional animal tracker Louis Liebenberg has, in fact, argued that our ability to reason scientifically is a byproduct of fundamental skills for tracking game animals that our ancestors developed. Liebenberg's analysis, uh, analogy between tracking and scientific method is revealing, quote, as new factual information is gathered in the process of tracking, hypotheses may have to be revised or substituted by better ones. A hypothetical reconstruction of the animal's behaviors may enable trackers to anticipate and predict the animal's movements. These predictions provide ongoing testing of hypotheses. Liebenberg distinguishes between systematic tracking, the systematic gathering of information from signs until it provides a detailed indication of what the animal was doing and where it was going, and speculative tracking, the creation of a working hypothesis on the basis basis of initial interpretation of signs, knowledge of the animal's behavior, and knowledge of the terrain that leads to hypotheses that are tested and, if not confirmed, to new hypothetical reconstructions of the animal's whereabouts. It's sort of a Popperian falsification type of uh, science. Speculative tracking also involves mm -hmm. another cognitive process called theory of mind, or mind reading, in which trackers put themselves into the mind of the animal they are pursuing and imagining what might be it might be thinking in order to predict its actions. Based on archaeological and anthropological evidence, Liebenberg estimates that humans have been hunting and using systematic tracking for at least 2 million years, far back as Homo erectus, and speculative tracking for at least 100,000 years. So that would be uh, your, your species, Neanderthals. Whenever these cognitive uh, capacities arose, once the neural architecture is in place to deduce, say, that a lion slept here last night, a person can substitute lion with any other animal or object. It can swap here with there and last night with tomorrow night. The objects and time elements of the reasoning process are interchangeable. In a modern example, once you've mastered the multiplication tables and you know that 7 times 5 equals 35, you can infer that 5 times 7 is also 35 because 5 and 7 are interchangeable in the equation. This interchangeability is a byproduct of neural systems that evolve for basic reasoning abilities such as tracking animals for food. And this is how the brain evolved one purpose can be put to another purpose 
And this cognitive capacity to substitute X's and Y's in a representational system that encompasses endless combinations and options from prey to people is what enables us to adopt the perspective of another moral agent and thus the cognitive architecture underlying moral reasoning. Anyway, so I was thinking about that with, you know, listening to your book. They might, they must have been fully moral beings as well, not not to mention cognitively sophisticated in terms of theory of mind, mind reading, putting themselves into the mind of the animals they're tracking. Everything we're able to do, uh, they surely were able to do. Yeah, I mean, I think the the I, I wrote quite a lot about tracking and about these different ideas about speculative tracking and things like that for that reason, because it does bring up this question of, you know, if you are a hominin lacking claws and, and teeth and um, you have weapons, but you don't have a great sense of smell and things like this. So you do need um, another way to, to hunt animals. And we, we know for sure Neanderthals were top level hunters in their environments. It's clear from, you know, we can see from the, the isotopes in their bones, the, the amount of meat they were eating, they were like wolves and hyenas, you know. Um, they did eat plants as well, but they were clearly top hunters. Um, but yeah, the question of sort of um, the level of skill you need as a tracker is going to change in the kind of environment you're in. Um, and in some places, it's going to be easier just to follow trails, um, you know, that, that will take you to to points in the landscape that are going to attract animals, water holes or mineral licks, things like this. And there are certainly places where we can see potentially that Neanderthals were ambushing animals there. But, yeah, I don't see why there's no um, possibility that Neanderthals would not have known animals as well as they knew their rock. Mm -hmm because they knew their rock um you know they they were you know as you say by hypotheses changing and adapting as, as you you're in a, a changing situation that's what happens when you nap rock if you have a core with a floor in the middle of it you've got to deal with that and all the different species we can see how selective they were about the materials not just in stone but in animal bones as well um they were interested in the meat the fat the marrow of course um, but we can also see them almost treating animal bodies as as bone quarries over time. They do become interested, not for making necessarily like, you know, formed bone tools very often. But what they did use um, animal bones a lot for was um, a tool for, for actually napping. Um, so when you're when you're working stone, you can use another stone to, to strike or you can use um, a, a bone to sort of get differently shaped flakes off. Um, and Neanderthals were doing this. These are called retouches, these pieces of bone. And they were super selective about the, the parts of the body they used. And in some cases, the species um, as well. And certainly for those um, those skin working bone tools, we can see clearly that they were selecting particular species for those. So they were well aware of different kinds of animals, the different products those animals provided, but presumably also the need to hunt animals in different ways. You know, they're taking mammoth, woolly rhino, massive horses, but also roe deer, little roe deer, boar, chamois, ibex. Those creatures are all going to require very different kinds of hunting and approaches and skills. And then also you've got the environmental change, you know, what you can do on the step is very different to what you can do in an enclosed forest. And we do see evidence for potential changes in, in the kind of spears that they were using, maybe. But in terms of the, their understanding of animals as um, sort of individual classes of animals, I think there must have been something going on there like that. And also, I think, um, you know, Liebenberg does, uh, does mention in some of his work that, you know, to actually follow animals and follow tracks you need to classify an animal by its track and that is a graphic symbol yeah, right. you know that comes to stand for that right. animal so we don't know if you know there was any kind of formalized system or you know, we don't know that but it's an interesting possibility that neanderthals at least understood what the the paw print of one creature meant versus and another. How long and of been course there. they see that and they see their own footprints everywhere. That you know, there's you mentioned this this potential handprint on um, from a Spanish cave. There's some debate about the dating of that. But other places there's an amazing French site where uh, in in sand dunes that's sort of 
think 80,000 years old. And there's this perfect little handprint there. They knew what their own body traces looked like. And when you look at hunter-gatherer groups now with with uh, tracking knowledge, they can tell the individual in their group by the, by their traces. You know, sometimes even when they're wearing foot covering, it's amazing. So there's no reason why Neanderthals certainly could not have developed quite sophisticated tracking abilities. But how that re- how that sort of spins out into their understanding of other animals as um, you know, other c- creatures with their own minds and this this predictive hunting that you get with speculative tracking. That's a different question and it's it's very intriguing. But I mean I think for me it sort of connects with how how many indigenous hunting and gathering peoples across the world understand the environment all around them plants rocks and other animals as um a web of relations you know they're not resources again it comes back to our sort of western classical understanding of of things which is very economically based indigenous ideas and particularly hunter gathering communities really don't don't think like that um they understand that those animals give them um meat and, and they know that but it's much more about those creatures being recognized as entities, you know, as another organism. Um, and so I, I do wonder with sort of the, the debates over, <clears throat> over what Neanderthal body processing meant, you know, I said earlier that people have said, Oh, it's, you know, it's, it's just cause they were starving and Oh, look, the patterns of the butchery is just like what they were doing to the animals in that site. So it doesn't mean anything. Well, what if their understanding of the animals was more like indigenous mm. peoples historically and today, rather than Western traditions that come from farming where animals are products and, you know, stock. Um, what if processing a body as you processed a reindeer was actually something that meant something to do with relationality and, and sort of, um, you know, cycles of, of food and blood. And, you know, I mean, you, you can come up with lots of interpretations, but I don't think we should rule out the fact that, that body processing was irrelevant just because it looks like what they did mm. with animals, because perhaps our understanding of what animals meant to them is lacking. Yeah. Yeah, I just had Joseph Henrik on my uh, podcast because he has that new book out, The, the Weirdest People in the World you know, weird of yes, Western yes. educated, uh, industrialized, rich and democratic. And that, you know, 99% of science is based on that, or at least psychology and social social science, you know, like you, you do a study of 100 undergraduates age 18 to 20 at a, at a, at a Ivy League university in America, and you conclude, this is what humans prefer. <laughs> well, <laughs> and then extrapolate that back to the path, uh, to the past. Uh, another mm-hmm. thing I was thinking about reading your book, um, you know, you look at the uh, injuries that lions sustain as as a top predator because prey animals don't want to die. They don't want to be eaten. So they bite back. They kick and <laughs> bite and, you know, and so forth. And lions have massive tools for hunting that, that uh, hominids don't. So, therefore, the social nature of, of hunting also must have been an aspect. You know, you go right and you go left and I'm going to hide behind the bush and then we're going to do this, you know, because... You, how else are you going to bring down one of these massive uh, prey animals? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think that comes to into the question of, you know, could Neanderthals speak? Could they talk to yeah. each other? Could they discuss the hunt right, the next right. day? You know, um, we we don't know that, but I think overall, the evidence is is definitely grown that some kind of vocal communication was important to them um, their anatomy in their ears you know that they it appears although this the shape is different in the, in the ears to us in fact when you model the sound frequencies it was tuned into it's the same as ours which is yeah. speech you know um so i think neanderthals were probably talking in some form but what they talked about and you know whether there's any remote resemblance to the kind of complex structured language you and i are dealing with right now um that's very difficult yeah. to tell and it's people will will argue totally different things on the archaeology mm. based on what their beliefs around linguistics and you know 
are in the first place. So I think What's that bone in the neck. I um, think the, the there's a bone in the neck that the higher bone, and they yeah. had that, which is related to the vocal cord, the box. Yeah, I think. Yeah, the anatomical uh, reasons why they couldn't speak have kind of crumbled. Basically, it it doesn't look like there's that much difference in the capacity. Maybe some of the vowels were a bit different, things like this. But overall, I mean, they were not uh, anyway as as limited in terms of, of vocal capacity as like chimpanzees. Nothing like that. Um, so I think most archaeologists would probably believe that there was some kind of vocal communication but as i say you know can you hunt a herd of horses by a lake without some kind of previous discussion about you know what does that look like um that's really difficult to tell and people people will argue about the level of complexity in the technology or in the hunting that requires you know some kind of actual um, planning or forethought. Um, I mean, personally, I think there must have been something like that um, because we can see, you know, that they they did not live, you know, a life in the moment. Um, and one of the, the best sort of examples actually of that is not just pure stone technology or hunting, it's um, composite technology, which is basically um, technologies where you stick two things together. Um, so you have a stone tip um, and a haft um, and then like an adhesive as well um, and we can see that Neanderthals were definitely doing that um, they were using uh, birch tar which uh, you can't just find that naturally it's not like pine resin that just bleeds out of a tree you have to cook it out of mm. birch bark um, and that's not something that sort of you produce at scale by accident you know it it can happen by accident in a fire, but only small amounts to 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 produce the larger amounts that we think that they had and the quality of the birch tar as well. Um, something else is going on. That's that's probably a technology that's been experimental, that has been honed. Um, and we find it through quite a considerable span of time and space. It's not many of these sites, but they they're in different parts of Europe and at different times which hints that this may have been a long-lived technological tradition. So that's interesting itself. But then just recently, um, there was a new find from Italy where the uh, adhesive is pine, probably pine resin, mixed with beeswax. Nice. Um, and yeah, pine resin by itself is not great. It's quite brittle. Um, and somebody's done really cool research um, where they sort of did, you know, actual stress and mechanical testing of these different products. And basically, birch tar is brilliant. Uh, pine resin is not so great. But if you want to improve pine resin, you should add beeswax. And that's exactly what they did. Um, so I think this notion of, of complexity in the processing of those products, but then to make a compound tool, you have to make the stone. You have to source that stone, produce it. You have to source a wooden handle, make that. Then you have to get the adhesive. Then you have to want to stick them all together. That's a material project that spans multiple places in the landscape and probably days. You know, that's that is something which is really hard for me to believe was um, not sort of at least part of a of a group dynamic of different individuals having different activities, different levels of skill, different sort of communication of those skills i think so you know i we can't know the the level of of sort of language involved in all that but there has to be some i think some aspect of that going on and certainly when you come to debates about could you teach those mm. kinds of skills or could you just learn them by copying it's not really clear yeah. um so yeah, but that kind of abstract reasoning that's involved in problem solving. So let's say, uh, and I have, I have some actual stone tools here that an archaeologist friend gave me after he retired. Uh, these are probably I don't know twenty thousand years old. I don't think they're Neanderthals. But let's say you have this, and then you have a big stick, and you want to stick that on the stick so you have it as a spear, whatever. You know, you have to think. Well, how am I going to make that stay into the stick when I use it? It's going to come off. So I'll try this pine tar or resin or whatever and wait a minute beeswax you know we we that stuff is pretty sticky i mean that requires a kind of i'm going to mix this with that if you think about the cognitive capacity that would have to be involved 
we could surely infer. Yeah, I think like that's, that they are interested. They're really interested in material properties and quality. You know, and whatever realm you you look at in the stone, in the animal parts, in the in the food from the animals, but the different parts of the animals. In, in all these plant-based materials as well. And, um, you know, you, you see this consistent picture of, of them being very aware of material properties and being concerned to get the best out of whatever environment they are in. You know, we see it with the kind of wood chosen for wooden tools, which we have an increasing number of, you know. Um, when they are in, uh, in wooded environments, in, in warmer climates, um, what, for what appear to be digging sticks, they're using the hardest local woods, which makes complete sense because you want it to be very durable. It means that that takes you hours to have to carve that and they're using fire to help them do it. So they're basically doing the things that make the most sense in terms of, of quality and efficiency in many areas of, of sort of their activity and their lives, really. Yeah. Yeah. What's it like to sit in an archaeological dig and think, this thing is 400,000 years old or something. I mean, and that, it must just be incredible <laughs> that, but, but, but so kind of walk us through what's a, what, what's a, a modern archeological dig like? I mean, reading your book, I, I'm thinking you got to have training in chemistry and, and, and biology and anatomy and physiology and botany and, and ar- I don't know what do you even call it, archaeobotany or whatever you find seeds and you have to know what those seeds represent. And it, it just seems so technical now. Well, luckily, you don't have to have all that training yourself. You have a archaeology now is massively multidisciplinary. Mm. You know, we have specialists in all these different areas. People train in those things and you bring together huge teams. People work together. So so, you know, there's there's no sort of lone genius anymore. Mm. It's, it hasn't been like that for a very long time. Um, but the the diversity of, of what we can do with the actual archaeology now is mind blowing. You know, you can see the daily growth lines in a Neanderthal's tooth. You can look at the scratches on the surface and it tells you not only the kind of um, food groups they were eating or the products that they were using their teeth to process, but even like whether they were left or right handed based on the directionality of the scratching and, you know, things like this. And, And then you look at their whole body, you can look at what they ate, how they were using their body. And then, yeah, like basically almost anything that, that, that you would want to know from the material, we can, we can nearly do it, but we are limited partly by the the preservation of things you know like although we have some sites with wooden objects they are really rare um and i think you know one of the things that i always say i would love would be a you know a preserved either like a periglacially preserved neanderthal um under the permafrost um Mm. or you know one up on on a mountain that's that's preserved under a glacier or something uh, because it would it would have that entire realm of of organic objects that that we suspect that they had with them all the time um that just don't get preserved oh you mean you mean something like uh the ice man uh what what was his name that that tyrolean yeah like Uh, yeah Utsi. so there's nothing like that for neanderthal yeah i mean he was so Oh, God, no. I mean, he was I remember when he was found, I wasn't very old and I was, you know, blown away because of the the fact that he, yeah, a, a body was really interesting, but it was all the stuff he had with him. It was his daily stuff that he just carried. And that's what we don't really have for Neanderthals. You know, we know a lot about the, the sort of things that they got up to and things. But, you know, what did a Neanderthal carry with them as they walked between places that they knew you know that kind of thing is really fascinating and a lot of those questions are the things that we would like to know because they may explain some of the patterns that we see between sites in choices about different technologies and and how that fits into the levels of mobility how far you're going to move will change what you carry things like this um so yeah i think that would be really amazing to find something like that but that being said you know what what we can do with what we have is really, you know, amazing. And, and I think, you know, when, when people are first finding the antiles and blasting them out with dynamite and all of this, you know, like, whereas now you've got like these wonderful projects that have been going for decades with the most minute attention to detail, you know, people taking, taking a layer down by this much in one field season and that's it for the year, but you're going to get tens of thousands of objects 
to process. And if you record them all in 3D, you can then reconstruct the spatial pattern of how Neanderthals were sitting around heart, all of that. You know, so the the what archaeology is nowadays is vastly different to how it used to be but that's why I can write a book like this you know um and and bring all that information out that is buried in hundreds and thousands of scientific papers and you know translate that for people basically that's what I try to do with this book. well you did a great job at it there must be thousands of the equivalent of thousands of pa- published papers that you've summarized if not more yeah um, how many professional archaeologists are there uh, archaeologists overall in the world, thousands, yeah. but um, people that study Neanderthals um, specifically, I mean, but again, it's difficult because, you know, people might be, as you say, an archaeobotanist and they might work on some Neanderthal sites, but they might work on other sites. So hundreds, I would yeah. say, you know, when you go to the conferences, there's there's probably hundred at yeah. least people who mainly work. Yeah, but not many. Yeah. In other words, um, it's uh, in other words, so much of this is no, no. Uh, depending on how many people are looking and where they're looking. I'll bet a frozen Neanderthal is somewhere in Siberia, fell in a, a hole somewhere, got buried. It's frozen over, you know, because they're always finding these uh, woolly mammoths where, you know, they actually have the, the skin and the yes. fur and body parts and so forth. Not just us. Yeah. I bet there's a Neanderthal out there somewhere. But it's just, you know, impossible to yeah. get to and there's no funding to go there or it's geopolitically not stable to be there, whatever. There's a hundred reasons why you, you, we're not finding them, but that would be spectacular. Wasn't there a movie? Wasn't it there would, a movie about would. that where they found a frozen Neanderthal and brought him back and, you know, he was sort of blown away by the modern world? <laughs> I forget what the name of that movie was, but I don't know if you ever saw that one. Yeah. yeah. So, no, I haven't yeah. seen that one. Though. So um, again, so you, you get a call from some construction uh, team that says, "Hey, w- 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 the law requires us to stop construction because we found these human bones." You get the call. What What do you do? You You rush to the site and you have. Well, um, I think most uh, for for Neanderthal archaeology, it's probably. I don't know what the balance is. I mean, there are cases where it's um, you would call that development archaeology, you know, where something's happened and something's been uncovered or they they know they need to build. And so they do an assessment. Um, But a lot of the time um, people are going out and doing research led archaeology where you would be going and digging in a site where, you know, there's deposits or um, what's happening in Central Asia a lot at the moment, um, because we, we believe that this is an area where, you know, there was a lot of potential movement and contact between Neanderthals and other hominins and people go out and do surveys across you know entire regions and mountain ranges and look for caves that are still full you know that nobody has been in and Mm. touched Um, and those are the places where you you know you've got potential treasure troves of information um, especially in cold regions as well like Denisova cave in Siberia um, is really important because it's uh, the conditions are so cold there that DNA survives very well. Um, we do not have DNA from any Neanderthals in the Near mm. East so far because it's much harder to get that material. So, um, so that's the difference. But in terms of you know what actually happens, most of the time projects these days are are long term mm. projects. You know, people commit to it for for years because that's how the funding system right. works. Um, you know, so but but people. What's really interesting is like with the uh, La Chapelle au Sans skeleton that we talked about earlier, where modern researchers have gone back to this site and reanalyzed it. Um, people are doing that at, at many other sites um, and sort of bringing modern techniques to bear um, to answer those questions. So at Shanidar as well, where they found this new skeleton, um, but also other sites, um, Le Moustier in southwest France, was one of the key sites uh, for the classification of Neanderthal stone tools. Um, and there were, you know, big sort of models and schemes about Neanderthal technology and, and its potential links to hunting and things. They were built around these sites that were excavated really early in the 20th century, not using our modern understanding of of how sites form and how quickly layers can build up and how, you know, you can have a layer that's this thick which is actually 80 occupations plus, perhaps. Wow. And, you know, therefore you can't treat all of that material as, as, as one occupation. Um, so we understand that a lot better now. Um, and depending on the site, 
you can unpick that you can't always but some places you can get very fine resolution records of, of occupation um, and people are going back to some of these classic sites like Le Moustier reassessing the material that exists in the museum's huge collections and saying mm, actually perhaps we've conflated mm. some of these mm. things here and we need to be picking these out a bit more and then they go back and if there's deposits still there like there is at Le Moustier you can then say right now we're going to take a fresh sample and see exactly you know what it looks like when we look at it with with modern understanding of, of technology and of um sort of the, the way the site has formed and things like this and the picture that comes out is quite different um so there is a lot i think that's that's going to change in terms of these sites that were old that are being reassessed yeah. as well as completely new discoveries. do you have a rule about like uh, in any particular site you have to leave some of it untouched so that 50 years from now when there's new uh techniques that uh future archaeologists will have they can assess it um, in some places they do that, yet yeah, they leave uh, what's called a witness uh, section <laughs> um, for that purpose that you would leave um, an area. Um, in other places, um, no, they're just they're just going straight down, but but very slowly. <laughs> right. So if I wanted to go into this field, I'm a young graduate student, and I come to you, and and, and where do I get funding, and, and, and you know how do, how do I get into this business? Um. It, funding for everybody is is difficult, you know. Before the pandemic, never mind yeah. that. Um, I think I would I would advise people to, um, to think about what area of archaeological science really excites them. You know, um, like something that's that's big now is uh, geo archaeology, um, but that might mean you know sourcing stone tools or it might mean the formation of a site or it might mean somebody who specializes in analyzing thin sections which are basically tiny slices through sediments which allow you to do things like unpick the number of times an individual hearth was burned you know um that kind of skill yeah. is really big um and it, you would be able to work across many sites not just um neanderthal sites other prehistoric sites and you know so it's those kind of um those skill sets that would be applic applicable to different periods but also are very big in in neanderthal archaeology i tell people to probably look at getting trained in that kind yeah. of thing is there funding from uh, national science foundations in different countries do you go to private sources i mean could you go to jeff bezos and go look you could become, you know, the biggest funder of of, of Neanderthal research, or you know, how does that work? Well, he could he could solve a lot of the world's <laughs> problems before he even gave money to archaeology. You know, I mean, yeah. But yeah, I mean, there there is some private funding, um, but uh, a lot of the time now, because projects are very large and they are, as I said, multidisciplinary, you tend to have. Um, people who are established researchers who write a project and then they write into that PhDs or postdocs mm. that are targeted to particular areas that they want to get done on their project. So that's one way of doing it. Um, that sort of, if you sort of <clears throat> read around archaeology, what projects are happening now, what sounds exciting, and then, you know, contact, uh, contact research teams and, and, you know, just reach out. Twitter is always a good mm a good way to, to connect with people. I find there are quite a lot of Paleolithic archaeologists on there, including me. <laughs> That's funny. Let's uh, wrap up talking about the extinction of Neanderthals. What's the uh, best arguments or evidence for why they went extinct? Or maybe, as I said earlier, extinction's the rule, survival's the exception. Maybe we're just the exception. And what happened to them is normal. Well, I think, I mean, the extinction question completely colors how we see neanderthals it always has done um you know putting that aside they were very successful before all of that there clearly is a question to be answered as to why we are here and we still look like us and they are not here except at a cellular right, the 2%. <laughs> um you know yeah so um, I think that what's interesting now that's coming out in terms of the the understanding that there was interbreeding earlier and the chronology for early Homo sapiens to have left Africa 
people used to think that that happened pretty late, like 40,000 years ago. Now it appears that um, early Homo sapiens, people were dispersing from Africa much earlier than that. As I said, they were in Australia, 60 to 65 plus. Um, they were in China somewhere, 80 to 120,000 at least. Um, and in the Near East, um, as early as 180,000 years ago. So the scope of time um, during which there were potential interactions has massively grown. Um, the question then is, why did it take or apparently take us so long to get into Europe? Um, they go, you know, we're going through the Near East, into Asia, into Australia. Why do we not see that record in Western hmm. Europe? So perhaps there's something going on with with that being being a heartland of Neanderthals. Maybe um, maybe they just were too successful and there was, you know, we couldn't get in. But if that's true, then what changed somewhere between 50 and 40,000 years ago? Um, technology may play a role. Um, although mostly the, the technologies are very similar between Neanderthals and early Homo sapiens before that, for example, people who say, oh, they didn't make stone blades. They definitely could make stone blades and blade that's um, they just were not interested most of the time. But what does seem to be perhaps different is um, there may have been different kinds of projectile weapons that were developed um, later sort of by early Homo sapiens people, somewhere between 50 and 45, we see lots of small points there. So possibly um, either darts or very lightweight spears or possibly even bow and arrows may have been involved. That's It's unclear, um, but perhaps a different way of hunting. Um, but something that, that does seem to be different is that, again, it's the DNA that's, that points this. Um, some Neanderthals, as far as we can see, were living in extremely small, effective breeding populations, you know, basically like, you know, a, a valley or whatever. Um, but the numbers were very small. Occasionally we have like um, indications where the, the, in, the inbreeding was super, super close, like, you know, grandparent with grandchild type thing. But that's only really one site. But overall, um they the populations do look pretty tiny in terms of the interactions and um, they weren't all super inbred but it's there whereas the earliest homo sapiens um genetic samples we have uh, there's one from a site in siberia called um Ustishim, uh, that's about forty five thousand years ago and another one from romania um, which is about 40,000 years ago, neither of those, uh, and another one from China, none of those show the small size of populations as we see in Neanderthals. So what it seems to be is that even though the numbers of people overall were probably very low, just like there were very few Neanderthals, probably wasn't more early Homo sapiens, but they seem to have been more interconnected to each other, that there was more, um, you know, they were not as cut off so that implies that there is something different at a social level. Um, they are remaining connected to each other, perhaps, or, or there's more meeting up, which may, you know, that there's many ways that you can read that. But it does point to some kind of difference in, in the connections between people and perhaps the, the strength of their social networks, um, for example. So that's a potential thing that's going on. You can add climate in there. I mean, Neanderthals had survived conditions that were similar to what was going on at the time when it wasn't super cold, but it was quite unstable. They had survived conditions like that before, but perhaps not with the added pressure of other, you know, this this other population coming in and, and sort of, you know, being around and, and maybe encroaching on their resources and things. So I think at the moment, it looks like it's a multi-stranded situation. And we mustn't forget as well that, you know, what is the case in France is not going to be the case in Uzbekistan. You know, for those Neanderthals, there's going to be a different story, a different end or Siberia. Um, in many different places. Um, yeah, exactly. So those, those situations are all going to be unique. Yeah. yeah, I vaguely recall there was some paper published about... Uh, a theory about the extinction of Neanderthals that in which if there was just a 1% difference in reproductive rate uh, per generation over 10,000 years, we could have 
So there, there's no cause other than we just m- made slightly more babies than they made over the course of 10,000 years. They're just gone. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, what there is no evidence for that we can see is any kind of outright conflict. Yeah. You know, we can't see that. What we do see is is it some interbreeding, hybrid babies, you know. So what the context for that breeding was, we can't really know if that was consensual or not. But certainly in some cases, those those hybrid babies were being raised in a group, you know, and babies that are totally neglected do not survive. You know, they they were being looked after by yeah. somebody. Um, so, you know, I think it's 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 extremely complicated. And what we what we are still really trying to get a handle on is uh, any cultural exchange. You know, what did that look like at, at a cultural level? If there is interbreeding, what does that actually mean? I don't think there was assimilation, you know, like we, we didn't sort of borg them, I always <laughs> say. Them. You know, we didn't totally take them over. <laughs> right. No, um, and the genetics doesn't say that. But, but you know, what's the scope for, for some kind of uh, cultural transmission? There are claims that that um, that there are some of the cultural entities that appear to have elements that look like what we see in later early Homo sapiens, so Upper Paleolithic, we call it, um, that perhaps they were to do with Neanderthals. But that still is debatable for me because the sites where we find Neanderthal remains, there's only two in these contexts. They look to be disturbed, yeah. and sites where there's no disturbance. We haven't found any antitor remains. And those cultural entities also don't look like they have any mix between what Neanderthals did and later people did. So I think that's an open question for me at the moment. Um, but it's very interesting, um, you know, and, and the question of could there be very brief contacts and incursions that we can't even see because the chronology that we're, we're dealing with is often quite, you know, on, on the scale of centuries, if not millennia, it's, it's difficult. Um, but I think we are inching towards understanding it better yeah. for sure. Well, Rebecca, I want to be mindful of your time. I loved your book. It's beautifully written. I'll just read the final paragraph here. And it, it's a very literary book. Uh, each chapter, each, oh, each chapter <laughs> opens with this kind of lyrical, uh, uh take the reader back in time on a journey, which is what I felt like reading your book. And by the way, you did a great job on the audio. That's really hard to read. It's hard to read a long book like that. I've done that myself for my books and I know how hard it is. Let's finish our shared journey through these pages by letting your guard down, push against the impossible and perform a quantum shift back in time to the Pleistocene. Close your eyes and pick a world, a grassy plain under cool winter sun. A warm forest track, soft loam underfoot, or a now sunken rocky coast, gulls cries salting the air. Now listen, step forward, she's here. And then you quote from The Last Neanderthal by Claire Cameron. When you're close enough, press the skin of your palm against hers. Feel her heat. The same blood runs under the surface of your skin. Take a breath of courage, raise your chin, and look into her eyes. Be careful because your knees will weaken, tears will come to your eyes, and you will be filled with an overwhelming urge to sob. This is because you are human. And then you end, Neanderthal, human, kindred. What a great ending. What a great book. And it was such a it was well, such a it was such a nice distraction <laughs> from the just the craziness of 2020. I'm listening to your book, you know, in the middle of the the whole Trump campaign and the 2020 election and and <laughs> COVID and the economy and and it was like, you know what? This is all just kind of surface stuff. If we if we look at it from a hundred thousand year perspective, this is meaningless. <laughs> so thank thank you for yeah, the distraction. I, mean, if, I think if the Neanderthals have. <laughs> They have anything to teach us? It's about resilience, that's yeah, for sure. Yeah. So, what's uh, next for you? Um, I mean, presumably, COVID will will disappear, or we'll get back to normal. Are you off on a dig next year, or you may even make plans? Uh, no, I'm I'm uh, I'm going to be writing book two. Hopefully, I'm uh, I'm yeah, looking to looking to get that sorted out with the what, publishers. So we'll what, we'll see what happens. But now, what's I have... that about? What's Sorry? book two about? Um, well, it's going to be about human evolution. It's going to be very much in the sort of the um, 
the the feel and, and the structure of kindred um but yeah sort of on a different a slightly different topic and theme um but yeah uh, i'm still i'm still discussing it with uh, with agents okay so. well i'll look forward <laughs> to reading that and we'll have you on again when that comes out <laughs> <laughs> yeah thank you all right rebecca thank you for your time and thank you for your work really really thank interesting thank you so stuff. much thank you very much